Good afternoon. My name is Bubbles. I'm popularly known as this name because my grandmother watched me being born and she announced I would be called Bubbles. I'm now 82 and I've recently heard about the computer museum and I noticed that on the wall was IBM and I thought well, the Hollerith key punching machine was there before IBM so I must tell them which I did hence I'm here today to try and help some of you see the machinery that we used in those good old days and this little machine here is all numbers and we would receive our invoices, hence this sort of thing, and read off the order, and etc. But every letter had to be transposed into a number. Well, there's only 10 numbers on here. And there's only 26 numbers in the alphabet. But then there's only 26 letters in all the alphabet composing the words. Hence, they introduced Hollerith key punching. And this was my job. I left school in 1947. I was trained in London to do this and uh, very fortunate indeed I was to have all this training because I had a very good job at the tender age of 14. And these numbers, you hardly looked at your keys. But you use them with finger, one finger. So don't chop it off when you're carving a joint because you've lost your job. And I would then read off the customer's name and address, etc. And this is all we put into numbers on this machine. And I can't use this particular card because it has been used, all the little holes, you might see them. But this would gradually, the more I did this, this would gradually, there's a card being pushed in. And as I transpose everything into reading this, and remembering the numbers and this is a spacer like a typewriter has and this is working its way back and the card would eventually come out at the other end finished and you turn your card over and you turn the page and to see what the next invoice contains but sometimes you would need a few cards for one order and it will be very carefully kept in place in order ready for the verifier to go through all your work and if her machine hit the wrong space it was wrong so your work would come back to you as she received it all in order and you would have to do it again but that's fine that's fine and they're all put in strict order according to the invoices because these must also be kept in a very strict order now then afterwards, when that is all processed and all the orders are done for the day, then they go off to uh, another machine, a collating machine, and this wonderful machine would leave all new invoices printed at the other end. So it's reversed itself, because the filing clerks wouldn't know what to do with the cards, <laughs> how to file them. But the precious invoices had to be filed and put into the drawers as they used to years and years ago. When I was training, I can only remember young ladies and girls being trained. And I did notice that in the office back at Janssen, that was a swimwear company, very posh, um, they used to have these operators, comptometer operators, and they wrote like big spiders. And we've got comptometry operators here at the museum. And there was a gentleman who came and uh, offered his services, a comptometer operator. And I'd never seen a gentleman comptometer operator. But to see these girls and ladies, again, all figures, all numbers, oh, their mind was boggled. And, and uh, I thought, oh, I could never do that. <laughs> so I've always enjoyed my Hollerith work. Yes. Just the only person that did this, or were there a whole no, group? no, no. There will be a group of us. Were you all friends? And... Didn't know each other. No. 
I, I was very new because I'd only just left school at 14. And um, it was my headmistress who actually saw that I was put on the right road. My mother was not interested in what my job was as long as it had a good wage packet. And um, when I had my first proper wage packet in the office, I didn't give it home. I, I didn't take it home properly, unopened. I opened it, I'd earned that, and that was mine. And it wasn't called a wage, it was called a salary. Well, I really felt, you know, my head was in the clouds because I didn't think people like me had a salary. You had a wage. <laughs> How much was I earning then? Um, I can't remember exactly. I know my very first wage packet was four pounds something. Four pounds something? A week. A week. Four shillings, four shillings and something a week. How quickly the mind goes. Hold on to your memories, my dears. Hold on to them. Now, these cards just had, they were, can you see these little holes? Well, this little machine, each number represents a letter. You see that? And that's come off of these. And space, and however, five letters, six, seven letters. And this would be describing the name and address of the company of the order and a date. And um, then you would proceed about swimsuits and anything to do with swimwear, sporty wear for swimwear. And then all these little cards, as I say, thousands of them. But you should see this collator work. All you would do would get all your cards together and done with the order and it would go into the front of this collator. I can't remember if it was this way or that way, but they would whip through and all be put in a different order. What they were doing with them, I don't know. And as I say, they'd come back again and they'd all be invoices back again for the filing clerks to file them. Because remember, it's the typist in the typing pool who typed out all the orders from the sales director's secretary. And then it's the filing clerks who have to keep them all in order for any queries that came up afterwards. But there were five or six of us, and I think there were th three or four verifiers. Did you talk to each other when you were typing up? Was it no, silent? no. Um, if you found a, a query on there, then you'd stop what you were doing and you'd put your hand up and either a verifier or Mr. McLean himself would come across to see and possibly you've noticed a typing error. It could be just something so small, but it all had to be very correct. I, I was always very pleased and when mine were, were correct and they went through and if they were wrong, it was a hell of a do, but never mind, we got through. We, we started at nine o'clock in the morning and then we would have a sort of 11s break. Not for very long, but you didn't go very far from the office. But the canteen did us a very good lunch, a proper lunch, and you stopped at a proper lunch time for an hour. And we finished at um, half past five. And then as time went on, I suddenly noticed some huge machines being delivered and a sort of a a square was made of this huge machinery, which was the IBM original machines. And Mr. McLean, our supervisor, bless his heart, who was a very dapper gentleman, blonde, with the brand new square rimless glasses, because that wouldn't be news to you, but they were to us. And he used to sit behind in his own little area. But then I watched him one day when I'd finished my machineries, and he was putting into a little board little pegs and he was just surrounded by these things nobody else did what he did putting these little pegs into the in this platform which was inserted into this big machine and it did all this wonderful work 
Well, then eventually, things changed rapidly. And I didn't really want to learn any more about this part of it. But I found my way out to the vestibule of the office in my lunch break, my lunch hour. And there were two telephonists on one switchboard with the little doll's eyes that came down and she rang a bell with a handle. Well, I was intrigued and I thought I would love to do that. I would just love to do that. And it turned out that they were two ex-GPO supervisors from the telephone exchange working on this switchboard. But at that time, I was quite a cockney and used to think and thought about everything, not thinking and being thoughtful. My grammar just wasn't good enough and my dialect certainly wasn't good enough for a telephone. And the two ladies, bless them, she said, if you want to learn to have a go on this switchboard, you will have to speak clearly and properly. Oh, I was game for anything. And so after I'd had my lunch, I'd scoot back to the vestibule in reception and they'd sit me at a phone, ring the phone, and I had to answer this phone. And it wasn't until I could answer that telephone properly and answer questions from them and between them, they gave me elocution lessons, which were, you know, not the real pucker ones, but it stood me in very good stead for years and years to come. And I still did my hollerith for quite some time because I did enjoy it, but they were wanting me to go on the IBM machines and that wasn't for me. Well, then many years went by and I did eventually become a top-notch receptionist for a top-notch company and until I was married. And then we had our children and as they started to learn to speak, I taught my children pronunciation. And they were quite posh when they went to the local village school. I can remember one day during the war, we were having our dinner. We didn't call it lunch, it was dinner. And it was at dinner time and it was sausages and mashed potatoes. And we were sat at the table and we had window, a window still quite high up. And two windows, a long garden, the big peerless uh, chicken wire fence at the bottom. And there was an enormous explosion which blew me off the chair under the table and everybody else and my four brothers around it. And um, my mother jumped out of the window. She ran hell for leather down the garden. She cleared the fence down the bottom and she shortened at me, now I am now. And uh, it was the bomb that hit the house at the bottom of the garden. Huge bomb. And that's, that's how close we were. <laughs> But I was, I was a bit sad at missing my, didn't know where my fish, my sausage and chips had gone. One very important thing um, is if somebody is explaining to you as a child, and perhaps you're a little bit older, 10, 12, and you keep saying, I know, yes I know. Never know. Always accept what you've been told and you must remember that. Because if you go to a lecture or anything when you're older, you've got to listen and, and not know it all. Because if you know all the time, you will be passed by because you don't need to be told. But I said in actual fact, don't know anything. I said, I go to all sorts of talks and lectures and I never know a thing. I listen and I remember. My advice to anybody, if you are watching this, particularly you youngsters in college, find out a little more about it and see where else the computer is going. It's going to every road you can think of now and I'm sure you won't be out of work when you finish your training. I hope not. <laughs>